Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us this evening for Diplomacy After Hours, Secretaries, Senators, and the Presidency. I'm Dr. Jane Carpenter Rock, Acting Director of the National Museum of American Diplomacy. We are the first museum dedicated to telling the story of the history, practice, and challenges of American diplomacy. We invite the public to discover diplomacy and how it impacts their lives every day. This museum is made possible through a public-private partnership with the Diplomacy Center Foundation, our philanthropic partner. To learn more about how to support the museum, please visit diplomacycenterfoundation.org. So let's begin. I am thrilled to welcome you to this program today, which was inspired by the historic events happening all around us with the change in presidential administrations. As many of you know, we welcomed a brand new Secretary of State to the State Department today, the 71st US Secretary of State. So this is a fine time to look back at the history of the role of the Secretary of State and the august pathway many secretaries have followed and blazed. It is now my pleasure to welcome the museum's public historian, Dr. Allison Mann, and her distinguished guest, Dr. Donald Ritchie, the historian emeritus of the United States Senate. I know we all look forward to welcoming them and to joining in on this fascinating conversation. Allison, welcome. Hi, everybody. Hi, Jane. Thank you so much for that warm welcome and that great introduction. So looking forward to this today. Um, I'd also like to, before we start the program, um, you know, give a welcome to our diplomacy and history fans and to thank my NMAD colleagues who are working so hard behind the scenes to make this happen. Uh, Victoria, who's gonna be sharing the slides, Jaquan uh, is streaming this for us. And then uh, my colleague Elizabeth is gonna be tracking your questions because we will have a question answer session at the end. So please put in your questions, put in your comments. If you're on YouTube, put it in there. Um, if you're streaming it from our, our webpage, put it in there and uh, looking forward to your questions questions and your comments on this program. And uh, before we bring uh, Dr. Ritchie to the screen, I'd just like to uh, introduce him to our viewers. Uh, he is a historian emeritus of the U.S. Senate. Dr. Ritchie graduated from the City College of New York and after service in the U.S. Marine Corps received his PhD in history from the University of Maryland. He joined the Senate Historical Office in 1976, the bicentennial year, where he conducted an oral history program, provided research and reference for senators, scholars, and the media, and prepared for publication such previously restricted documents as the closed door hearings of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. His books include The Congress, A Very Short Introduction, Reporting from Washington, A History of the Washington Press Corps, and a soon to be published study of the columnist, Leaks, Lies, and Libel in Drew Pearson's Washington, which I am very much look forward to because State Department plays a huge role in that book. Uh, so I'd like now to welcome Don Ritchie to our program. Hi, Don. Hello. Hello, nice to see you. Um, so before we get on to moving into the slides here, we have our cavalcade of stars. And unfortunately, in the 45 minutes that you and I have to talk and answer questions afterwards, we can't talk about all of them. So this is a, a select few. You sort of see the preview on the screen here. Can you just give us quickly for our audience the numbers of secretaries who've become president and senators and... Just let oh, us there, know about the numbers. There have been six uh, secretaries of state who became president of the United States. Uh, there were another 10 who ran for president and didn't win. Uh, and then there are about 25 secretaries who served in the US Senate, many of whom served in the Foreign Relations Committee. So that's, you know, kind of interesting. So I think, you know, as we move on through this discussion, we're going to be looking for patterns and maybe see if the pathway to the presidency changed a little bit. And that's what our audience can look forward to. But before you and I um, go into that detailed uh, discussion, I want to just go through a few slides of our museum for our audience so they kind of know internally what we're working on. So Victoria, if you go to the next slide, please. This is the exterior of uh, the National 
National Museum of American Diplomacy. It's at the 21st Street entrance in Washington, DC in Foggy Bottoms neighborhood. We've completed this, we call it our pavilion, and we are going to be expanding uh, in the next couple of years to include a complete hall of history and also another hall that talks about the practice of diplomacy. So before the pandemic, we were partially open to the public um, before we had to shut down. And if you go to the next screen, Currently on display is our preview exhibit called Diplomacy is Our Mission. And this was really um, a way for us to uh, introduce the public, give them a taste of what was to come. And we work with Smithsonian exhibits to, to make this happen. And it was really important for us to put some icons in there, some familiar figures of American diplomacy. And you can certainly see that we've got those Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, who we'll talk about in just a second, and then Madeleine Albright over there. And then finally, for our future plans for when we do expand, if you move to the next slide, please. We are planning a complete exhibit uh, in, our, in our third hall that talks about the secretaries of state. We call it Secretary's Row. So this will be a way for um, our visitors to go into the personalities and just learn a little bit more about who these 71 men and women are. So we're, we're really looking forward to that. And that will be you know, fully open to the public when we finish the completion of the museum. So let's get into the meat of the matter and let us start at the number one. So if you move on to the next slide, please, Victoria. Thomas Jefferson. So Don, um, I actually looked this up because I wasn't sure. You know that famous story about his tombstone where he didn't put that he was president of the United States on his tombstone. He didn't mark that he was the first secretary of state on his tombstone either. Yes, there is a certain modesty to that, uh, of that tombstone. Uh, Jefferson did uh, quite a bit. He'd also been our uh, minister to France before he was secretary of state. He'd also been the author of the constitution, the primary writer of the constitution. Uh, and, and he was a man of great stature and renown in the country. So uh, on one hand, the, the Articles of Confederation Congress decided to send him to France to negotiate for the, with our principal ally at the time. Uh, and then when Washington formed his first government, uh, the first department that was created by Congress was the State Department. And Washington appointed Jefferson, whom everyone considered to be a, a leading citizen. And he had replaced um, Benjamin Franklin as- That's right. Right? He's, right? He said that uh, he, no one could fill uh, uh, Franklin's shoes, but that he was succeeding him at least. Uh, but he had been sent over actually uh, to negotiate beforehand. Uh, this was a time in which the fledgling Republic was trying to establish itself in Europe, was trying to open up uh, commerce, uh, trade to protect the shipping. And so we sent some of our uh, really heavy hitters, our big guns uh, to Europe. Uh, John Adams was in England, uh, Franklin was there, uh, several others uh, who became Secretary of State uh, later on were uh, over there working to try to get uh, Europe to respect this brand new Republic and, and uh, a colony that had broken away. Well, we talk about this a lot in the museum that um, I think a lot of people don't understand how fragile um, you know, this new republic was and that its success didn't just uh, it didn't wasn't just determined by what was going on domestically, but it was that recognition of sovereignty from the rest of the world. And you did need these powerhouses um, to create these very strong alliances, uh, you know, to make that that happen for the security of the United States. That's right. They were dealing with royalty uh, and the royalty certainly didn't respect the idea of a republic. I uh, didn't trust it. And so uh, we had to show that we were a, a viable government and that we could sustain ourselves at that stage. And uh, some of those early negotiations did not work out all that well for us. Uh, we had to take really tough bargains, but we had people who were uh, very shrewd and uh, able uh, individuals. And so it's not no surprise that they were invited eventually to become secretary of state uh, and that so many of them became president in the early Republic. So was Jefferson a, a good Secretary of State? Because we see here that he doesn't fill out the whole term. No, he leaves in uh, 1793. And uh, uh, he, uh, he's the, the first among equals, I suppose, in the cabinet. But he has a lot of rivals. And in particular, he has Alexander Hamilton, who is setting up the first financial system in the country and the, 
working to uh, expand manufacturing and concerned about the tariff. Uh, Jefferson was an agrarian. Uh, basically everything that Hamilton wanted to do, he found abhorrent. Uh, he and, and Hamilton fought bitterly. They actually both subsidized newspapers that attacked each other and poor George Washington was caught in the middle. Was, Washington wanted to rise above politics, but really the political parties were beginning to develop right in his cabinet. Yeah, it sounds like hurting a bunch of, you know, troublesome cats sometimes, right? Perhaps not unusual for what presidents face with their cabinets. <laughs> well, I, it was an experiment too, right? Um, and so, okay, so Jefferson resigns. He's like, I've had it. I'm going back to Monticello. I'm going to grow my tomatoes, whatever. And, you know, does he say you don't have, you know, Jefferson to kick around anymore? Is he aspiring to become president or what's going on? Now, as a matter of fact, uh, Jefferson and his uh, sidekick, James Madison, went to New York to, and helped to form the first political party, the Republican Party. Uh, Washington's party, the Federalist Party was coalescing, but they, this was the first gonna be the first opposition party. Uh, they were dealing with some, with, a, with the Northern figures, including uh, Aaron Burr at that stage. Uh, and so Jefferson was very much in the mix. Now, uh, Washington, of course, served two terms uh, and uh, he was unopposed in his two terms, but um, it soon became obvious that there, he was going to step down after two terms. And then there was a battle royal and Jefferson became the uh, candidate of the Republican party against Vice President John Adams. And in a very peculiar circumstance, because of the way the constitution was written at the time, Adams won and became president. Jefferson came in second and became vice president. And so he actually served as vice president in the term of the man who had defeated him for the presidency. I know, which is like inconceivable for this to, you know, people to even think about this today. And I don't think it went over very well with them either. And it seems like, okay, well, if we're gonna have vice presidents now becoming president, I guess John Adams just turned out to be too obnoxious and disliked to make it, right? In, well, in it's interesting. We sort of think that vice presidents are natural candidates to become president. But after John Adams, uh, the, the trans transition becomes uh, uh, secretaries of state, a whole series of secretaries of state who become president. Uh, and it's a rare occasion for a vice president to even now to be elected immediately after their, um, their, their, pres their president they served for served. So for instance, you had Martin Van Buren after, after Andrew Jackson and then it's not till George H.W. Bush after Ronald Reagan, another vice president is immediately elected. Uh, there are certainly vice presidents who got, came into the job because the president had died. Mm -hmm. And there are some situations where vice presidents go off and come back. Richard Nixon and mm -hmm. Joseph Biden now are uh, two cases of that uh, uh, situation. But uh, instead in those early years, in part because there really was not a big political uh, movement in the sense that they were, it was the parties were organized. Uh, the candidates were chosen by uh, congressional caucuses and they picked the people that they respected and they knew the best uh, and who they'd seen in action. And so uh, those congressional caucuses began uh, picking secretaries of state. It's interesting that once we start creating uh, conventions, political conventions, far fewer secretaries of state become president. That is interesting. Well, let's move on and talk about some of them because it seemed like in these early years when foreign policy was so um, important and, and uh, essential to the security of the Republic that it was almost like this was the mold. So if we move on, Victoria, to the next slide, let's talk then about the next secretaries that will follow Thomas Jefferson, notably James Madison and James Monroe. So already it seems like this is going to be the way to become president was to be secretary of state. Yes, very much so. And uh, these are part of the Virginia dynasty they're known as. Uh, these are Virginia gentlemen planters. Uh, uh, Madison and Monroe had actually run against each other in the, for the first Congress. Uh, but they certainly all knew each other. Uh, yeah, it didn't get ugly, right? That was not no. an ugly thing, yeah. Ma Madison had, had not gone abroad, but Monroe had. Monroe had been serving mm -hmm. uh, in Europe uh, significantly uh, during uh, this period. But Madison was Jefferson's right-hand man in a lot of ways, a very shrewd politician, the principal author of the American Constitution. Uh, and they were, he and, and Jefferson were uh, 
uh, mostly dealing with the troublesome war going on between England and France in which American shipping was caught in the middle. And they were trying very hard to protect American shipping, to protect American commerce, uh, but they stumbled into a very poor policy uh, called the embargo, which uh, really uh, hurt American uh, industry considerably and uh, it really hurt uh, uh, Jefferson's administration. And then it left Madison with a very troublesome relationship with uh, England that would eventually lead to war during his presidency. But do you think it was their knowledge and expertise in foreign policy and their ability, perhaps clumsily, you know, at times, but was it their ability to navigate those waters that would make them uh, very desirable, even to both parties? Oh, oh, definitely. And of course, in addition to foreign issues uh, the, uh, across in Europe, we had uh, troublesome borders across the United States that involved negotiating with Spain around in Florida, involved, uh, we're, we're worrying about France and we're about England. Uh, we were surrounded essentially by European powers. It's while Madison is secretary of state and while Monroe is off in, in France that we get probably our best deal ever when we purchase the Louisiana Purchase and mm -hmm. double the size of the United States for a, a relatively small price. Uh, mostly because Napoleon was moving on and trying to, to uh, dislodge this, uh, this issue. But uh, there were some great successes they had and they involved diplomacy and, and a knowledge of uh, international relations. I'm glad that you brought that up, John, too, because um, we're gonna move on to the next person in just a second. But you know what we talk about in the museum a lot that we wanna convey in our exhibits is that these treaties had consequences. They had consequences for enslaved people, um, for the domestic slave trade. Of course, the international slave trade was you know, abolished in, in 1808, and I, I use the air quotes because it still continued, but the Louisiana Purchase you know, brings you know, millions of Native Americans into the mix here who had no say at, at the treaty table. And all of this is happening uh, you know, under, under these secretaries of states and under these presidencies. But in the 1820s, we start to see a shift, right? Um, in terms of the, those questions coming to the forefront. Now, Monroe, I think um, he's most famous probably for the doctrine that bears his name, which is a good lead on into our next person. Yes, uh, uh, James Monroe gets a lot of credit for the Monroe Doctrine because it was in his State of the Union message, mm -hmm. but it was actually his Secretary of State, John Quincy Adams, who drafted the Monroe Doctrine. Uh, and uh, Adams was a veteran uh, uh, diplomat. His, his father had been minister to England. Uh, he went off at a very young age. He was minister to, to Russia. He was in Ghent in, uh, uh, when they negotiated the treaty that ended the War of 1812. Uh, so when he came to uh, become Secretary of State, he uh, was as well-trained a diplomat as had ever taken the job. Well, let's let him take center stage then. Bye, Monroe. Let's 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 move to Victoria. Advance on and let's take a look at uh, JQA. And I know that all of my my colleagues at the museum are, are laughing because I, I talk about him so often. But he is the first, as you said. So he's a senator who becomes uh, Secretary of State. And he later becomes a congressman and he's president, you know, so he holds all of these different offices. And when he's Monroe's secretary of state, um, I, I think, you know, when you ask any historian, the top three, sometimes he's number one a lot. Well, historians particularly like it because he kept a very detailed diary. And <laughs> so we know a lot about what he was thinking and what he was doing, but he was a superb diplomat. Uh, he was a less uh, able as a politician uh, and he suffered as a result for that. The Adamses were a bit prickly. They were uh, mm -hmm. a little on the stiff side. They weren't- Well, now uh, I'm from New England, so, so you know, <laughs> I, I understand that reputation. I get it. <laughs> but, uh, but he was a man of great distinction. And of course, uh, uh, his, his problem in part was that the political party system had collapsed during the Monroe period. We had the era of good feelings in which it was essentially just one big party. But instead of this, the old system where the two parties picked their candidates, you now had lots of factions that were picking candidates. And so when it came time for, Monroe, for Adams to run after Monroe was stepping down, there were actually four major candidates uh, for president that year. Uh, and he was uh, 
in a sense, the New England candidate. But the people's candidate was Andrew Jackson, uh, who had been the hero of the Battle of New Orleans uh, and who uh, uh, was, was well respected, well liked, uh, but also well feared. Uh, people like uh, Jefferson and, and uh, 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 Madison and Monroe were very nervous about this man on horseback who would be coming into, into government. And so there was a lot of opposition to, uh, to Jackson. And when the uh, election was held, nobody got a majority of the electoral votes. And so which case then the House of Representatives is designated by the constitution to choose a president. Uh, uh, Jackson had gotten the plurality, he'd gotten about 41% and Adams had come in second. And Henry Clay, the speaker of the house was also one of those candidates. But the system in the House was to drop off the person who got the less, lesser votes. And eventually Clay was out of the race. And so whoever Clay threw his support to was probably going to get the, the presidency. And Clay threw his support to John Quincy Adams. He had known him. Uh, they had both been again, uh, negotiating that treaty. They're very different men, mm -hmm. but they respected each other's abilities. And uh, Adams chose uh, Clay as his secretary of state after Clay had thrown the election in the house to him. Well, the Jacksonians erupted and they called it a corrupt bargain. And that in a sense almost sealed the doom for poor John Quincy Adams's administration because uh, he served one term and then he faced uh, Andrew Jackson and was defeated uh, for his reelection. So like his father, these Adamses, <laughs> right? They, they served the one term. And then I feel like John Quincy Adams maybe messed up the whole secretary of state to president thing for everybody else from henceforth, because now you start seeing all the senators clamoring. And um, we'll move on to Clay and Calhoun in just a second. Um, but I'm kind of wondering, like, if that corrupt bargain, like if that tainted Clay's chance, it really, of ever getting to the presidency. Henry Clay was one of the most skillful politicians ever on the American scene. Uh, lots of other people admired him enormously. Abraham Lincoln thought he was his great hero in politics. He was a problem solver. Uh, there are loads of compromises that have Clay's name on them because he came through and got people to sit down and to work things out. He wanted very much to be president. He was a candidate five times for president of the United States. He really thought he was going to get elected. And it was one of his great disappointments that it, it never happened. And in some cases, he outsmarted himself on a number of occasions. Uh, and uh, uh, he, he contributed to his defeats. But in other cases, it was just very bad timing for him. Uh, and, uh, uh, and it's probably a, a regret to the nation that, uh, that he never served as president. On the other hand, uh, he's a typical of what happens to people whose career is legislative. Because if you're in a Congress and in the House or the Senate, you've got to vote on everything. You can't hide your feelings on foreign policy. You can't hide your feelings on domestic policies. If you're governor, where you stand in terms of foreign policy is, you know, is, is questionable. But a senator has voted on every one of these occasions. And Clay had cast enough votes to offend large groups of the country that he could not expand his base when he was running. In fact, it shrank with each time. Interesting. I didn't mean to talk so much about Clay and skip over Martin Van Buren because we'll get to Clay's image in a yeah. second. But Van Buren kind of surprise, surprise, he was Secretary of State too. And I think maybe, you know, his rise to the presidency, it's almost like dumb luck and <laughs> the things that Calhoun does too. We have an image of him in just a second, but I want to right. linger on Van Buren for a minute. Well, Van Buren, was, uh, he was, it wasn't dumb luck with Van Buren. He was a very shrewd politician. He was much more of a politician than he was a diplomat. And he served as Secretary of State under Jackson. He resigned voluntarily because there was a crisis in Jackson's cabinet and that allowed Jackson to clean out the cabinet by his stepping down. So Jackson appointed him to be minister to England. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's uh, on the boat sailing to England when his vote came up in the Senate. Now that he had been a recess appointment, that's the reason he left early. And uh, there was a tie vote. And the vice president of the United States, Jackson's own vice president, John C. Calhoun, voted against uh, uh, Martin Van Buren and just thought that was the greatest thing that he, he was a rival. And he said, I've killed him, I've killed him dead. And <laughs> Thomas Hart Benton, one of the other senators at the time said, no, you've just made a new vice president. And in fact, uh, in the next election, Jackson did dropped uh, uh, Calhoun as his running mate. 
and chose Martin Van Buren as his running mate. And Van Buren then succeeded Jackson when he retired. Oh, it's so interesting. Before we move on, Victoria, I just wanted to point out one thing and, and, and put in a plug. These two men would kind of come up against each other in a foreign policy issue about La Amistad. While Martin Van Buren was president, um, this is when John Quincy Adams will bring up the case of the uh, kidnapped Africans aboard La Amistad. So you have these two former Secretary of States kind of going at odds. And we're going to have a conversation about that in our Diplomacy Classroom series on February 9th at 1 p.m. So if any of our viewers are interested in that, please be sure to tune in. So Victoria, let's move on to the images of, of Calhoun and Clay. Because really here, what, I, what I'd love for you to talk about, Don, is... Um, I was thinking about this this morning, you know, uh, these, these long time, uh, you know, senators and influencers and, and their role in the, in the fatal compromise of 1850. And what I was thinking about is that I, I kind of wondered if the stress of that led to all of them kind of passing away at the same time. <laughs> I'm like, did the stress of that kill Calhoun? I think he dies in 1850 and Clay dies in 1852. And then Webster a few years later, it's like they kind of all, you know, once the country starts to fracture, they're gone. Well, they were also of an advanced age at that stage and Calhoun did have tuberculosis. So there was more than just stress, but they had devoted their entire lives to their, their careers, their legislative careers. Calhoun, uh, Clay, and Webster all aspired to be president, and all of them had the capabilities uh, to do that. And in the late 19th century, there was a British minister to the U.S., uh, Lord Bryce, who wrote a wonderful book called The American Commonwealth, and he has a chapter in it called Why Great Men Never Become President. And what he had in mind was Webster, Clay, and Calhoun stood head and shoulders over the, the presidents of their era, people like Millard Fillmore and Franklin Pierce and, and Tyler, uh, the accident, Tyler, John president. Tyler. Right, right. Uh, mm -hmm. These were they were far more significant figures, and the, actually the history books uh, usually devote even more space to them than to some of the presidents that they that they ran against. Uh, they they did not like each other. They they fought <laughs> against each other. Uh, uh, Clay and Calhoun were great rivals, and that was one of the reasons why neither of them got to be president. But at one point late in his life, uh, John C. Calhoun said, I don't like Clay. He's a terrible man. He's vicious. He's this and that and that. But by God, I love him. And the, there was a fact that they, they also had served together uh, and they, they were, uh, they were uh, messmates, literally, because that's what they used to call the, the places where the members would live in those days. The, uh, the Capitol Hill mess was actually a boarding house where members lived and ate together. And so they knew each other intimately as, as colleagues, uh, but they were also terrific rivals, rivals in Congress and rivals for the presidency. Yeah, it, I think it's kind of really hard, you know, to look at somebody you're eating breakfast and dinner <laughs> <laughs> dinner with, you know, and not to have some kind of, of sense of camaraderie, I, I think. But, you know, we're, we're, it's funny, we're in that sort of bridesmaids never becoming a bride, you know, sort of era here. And, and let's move on to the next slide and talk a little bit about Webster, the, the most famous orator of, of his time, I think, and certainly, like you said, very savvy, and, and I think a very successful um, Secretary of State. Yes, and served twice as Secretary and uh, was... Uh... He was a, a, the really critical person in uh, William Henry Harrison's uh, administration because that administration only lasted for a month. And when Harrison died, there was some question as to whether or not John Tyler, his vice president, was really going to be president or going to be acting president. Right. And, uh, and the fact that Webster stayed in his cabinet when all the other Whigs resigned because mm -hmm. really... Uh, They'd been elect they'd elected a Whig president, but he'd been running with a Democrat for a vice president. And Tyler was out of step uh, in terms of all his ideology with the rest of the cabinet. And so they resigned. But Webster, by staying, gave gravitas to that administration. And the, that's a very important factor. And a lot of the secretaries of state have been uh, people who have individual respect nationally. Uh, they have stature uh, and they're sort of the second person in a sense. Uh, and, and the country looks to them to give some stability and some, again, gravitas to the administration. So do you think that, you know, Tyler, you know, leaving office, uh, ugh, you know, just like wig and name only kind of, do you think that Webster's association with him hurt his chances of becoming president? 
uh, Webster had to make a lot of difficult choices uh, that eventually kept him from becoming president. One was uh, staying in that cabinet. The other was when he went back to the Senate and uh, that in those days, senators could come and go because state legislatures would elect them and they really didn't advance by seniority the way they do today. So they would step in and out of the, of the Senate as it served their purposes. But he was there in 1850 when Clay was working at that great compromise of 1850 when John C. Calhoun was passionately opposed to it, when it was basically trying to figure out what to do with all the territory we had amassed at, at, after the uh, Mexican War mm -hmm. uh, and to whether or not it would be slavery or not. Uh, and uh, Clay went personally to see Webster and convinced him to support the compromise, in particular, the F Fugitive Slave Act, yes. which meant that any slave who left, uh, the uh, enslaved person who left the South and got into the North could be arrested and returned. And in Massachusetts, that was a very offensive thing and it really uh, undermined uh, whatever chances Webster had at that point in his career. Of well, did it also violate the uh, Massachusetts personal liberty law? So this is a state's rights issue that all of a sudden Senator Webster gets involved and in. he has to either defend his state or defend this compromise. Yes, and unfortunately the constitution did support the Fugitive Slave Act and so uh, there was a national issue as well as a state's issue. And, that, and Webster was really a, a national figure. Uh, unlike Calhoun, who would start out as a nationalist and reverted to being a state's rights person. Mm -hmm. it, was, um, it was Webster and, and uh, Henry Clay who in many ways tried to rise above uh, their regions and their states and really were national figures of note. Well, speaking of stress and the slavery issue, <laughs> we come on to our, our next, uh, f you know, fairly good Secretary of State and very successful uh, Senator from Pennsylvania who finds himself as president in the greatest crisis this country has ever faced. Yes, you know, on paper, uh, <laughs> James <laughs> Buchanan had a great resume. Uh, he'd been a Senator, he'd been a very successful Senator. He'd been Secretary of State under James K. Polk during the Mexican War and with the Oregon uh, boundary uh, issue. Uh, he'd been a you know, potential presidential candidate, but uh, he uh, instead during when Franklin Pierce became president, he went to England as an American minister to England. And that was the best thing that happened to him because he was out of the country during the turbulent 1850s when uh, things are really pulling apart, particularly over the slavery issue. So he and didn't have to much, take a side, right? He everybody was on one side out. or the other, mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, uh, Buchanan was known as a doe face. And that was a Northern Democrat who was sympathetic to the Southern Democrats, to the slave owning Democrats. And so he was acceptable to the South, but he was a man of the North. And he was also out of the country and he hadn't voted on all the difficult issues uh, of, the eight, of the early 1850s. And so he comes back and becomes uh, the uh, president of the United States. Now, of course, he's the last secretary of state uh, to eventually become president. And maybe he, he did it, uh, he cursed the, the situation for everybody else because he dithered as president. He couldn't make up his mind and the country literally fell apart uh, while he was president. Uh, it, whenever C-SPAN does a poll of presidents, Buchanan has regularly come in last. And my favorite quote from Buchanan is riding with Abraham Lincoln uh, on the way to Lincoln's inauguration in 1861. Buchanan said, if you're as happy to be entering the presidency as I am happy to be leaving the presidency, you are the happiest man in the world. Uh, and so at one term as president, was absolutely enough for James Buchanan. That was more <laughs> enough for him. It was like he was out of the country during all the problems, and then he's president. And he's like out to lunch, you know, during his presidency. <laughs> so um, I want to be cognizant of the time. So let's move on. And I think the next slide brings us into the 20th century. Yes. So here we have a couple of, you know, really interesting figures. Um, let's talk about William Jennings Bryan. I was thinking about this today, who I believe, and correct me, Don, if I'm wrong was the first secretary of state to resign over moral reasons for his resignation. Yes, so uh, it's not so clear as to what some of the other secretaries resigned over, but, but uh, uh, William Jennings Bryan, among other things, was a pacifist. And he did not believe that the United States should go to war. And as the situation with Germany became more intense and as President Wilson, even though Wilson was being neutral, but anytime Wilson uh, chided uh, Germany for such things as sinking the Lusitania, 
and loss of American life, uh, Bryan felt that it was moving the country too close to war. Bryan was a three-time presidential candidate by the Democrats in 1896, 1900, 1908. Uh, he was by far the most popular Democrat in the country. And so Woodrow Wilson, who was a relatively newcomer to politics, he'd only served as governor for two years when he was elected president. Before that, he'd been president of Princeton University. Uh, but Wilson understood that he needed uh, Bryan's uh, support for his administration to rally his party. And presidents have often turned to uh, other leaders of their party who have great stature, who are great known in, within their party and known nationally. And so he turns to Bryan, although Bryan is a very difficult person. Uh, he's, as a, in addition to being a pacifist, he's a teetotaler which is not very good for diplomatic receptions. Oh no, was he a little bit <laughs> sanctimonious too with that teetotaling? Total, yes, um, uh, unfortunately, uh, he wasn't the first. Uh, diplomats have always had to deal with this issue sometimes when they're dealing with American uh, politics. But, uh, uh, but Brian was a difficult person. And uh, he, uh, I think Wood Woodrow Wilson was quite happy eventually to have him out of his, his administration. So his resignation actually served Wilson's purposes and H Wilson's subsequent Secretary of State was much more of a diplomat, uh, Robert Lansing. But you know, I, what's so fascinating to me about him too is that he's got this such broad popular appeal with you know millions of Americans. He brings the heartland to Woodrow Wilson, who is this coastal elite who then takes the presidency, which is something that Brian you know, so much right. wanted. And you know, Wilson, when he ran, never got as many votes as Brian did when he lost. So and interesting. The reason why, when, when Wilson ran in, uh, in mm -hmm. 1912, there were three presidential candidates, one of whom was a progressive, Theodore Roosevelt, which split mm -hmm. the Republican vote. And so Wilson really won by a plurality, whereas uh, uh, Brian had uh, many more support, uh, voters who actually showed up to support him. And that, that also added to his coming into the cabinet. So let, for our audience, though, just to be clear, um, Brian never served as a, sec as a senator. No, Brian was in the U.S. House of Representatives, but he did not serve as a senator. Mm -hmm. um, well, let's move on then to a senator. Um, probably not a name familiar to a lot of people in our audience. And you put him on the list to talk about. So, you know, what, what do you think is so, is so notable about, about him? Well, Ed Muskie in his time was a very notable uh, person. As a U.S. Senator, he was uh, very active. Uh, a lot of the clean air and clean water bills that we have are, uh, were part of his uh, initiative. And Senator uh, he from was, Maine, sorry, Don. Senator, Senator from Maine. Maine. Uh, he was a Democrat from Maine. He, he ran as vice presidential candidate with Hubert Humphrey from, in 1968. They narrowly lost to uh, Richard Nixon and Spiro Agnew. And then he was the leading candidate really for to run against Nixon in 1972 until his campaign collapsed. Uh, and it turned out he was the victim of the dirty tricks that the Nixon administration or the Nixon political operators were involved in. And they had uh, uh, made Muskie look bad in public. Uh, and so his, his presidential ambitions declined. He went back to the Senate. He was still a very influential Senator. But when uh, Jimmy Carter needed a, a Secretary of State because his secretary had resigned over a, a, a moral issue, essentially not being informed when the, the president was sending uh, troops to rescue the uh, hostages in Iran, uh, that was Cyrus Vance who stepped down. Suddenly Carter needed a, uh, uh, a Secretary of State and it was a presidential election year. So he needed somebody with stature uh, and uh, Muskie accepted. A lot of his friends on Capitol Hill were quite surprised. And Senator Muskie said privately, haven't you ever heard of a graceful exit? Meaning <laughs> he was getting ready to leave Congress. He was happy to go. Uh, and this was a very nice, a very uh, prestigious way to, to leave. By the way, one of his top staff members and his protege was George Mitchell, who eventually became Senator from Maine and who uh, eventually became a, a very successful diplomat in his own right. Now, wasn't um, Muskie also the victim of the famous tear as well? Yes, that was the dirty trick. The um, Muskie was uh, uh, campaigning in New Hampshire, uh, and there was a, a scurrilous attack on his wife at the time uh, that turned out to have been drafted by people working for Nixon's campaign. And Nick, uh, Muskie stood up to defend her, uh, 
it was snowing. There's always a question as to whether it was snow in his face or, he, or a tear in his face, but it was seen to be unmanly for a man to, to shed a tear in public. And in those days that uh, undid his campaign. It, uh, it undermined him at the time because we were looking for someone who'd be tough to stand up to the Soviets during the Cold War. Yeah, kind of reminiscent of Howard Dean and the famous Scream, right? Yes, and, and, and ironically, uh, Muskie had a ferocious temper. He was a very tough guy. Uh, so to be brought down by a tear was very, uh, was uh, out of character for him. I'm sure that was probably a gut punch. So he went yeah. from senator to running for the presidency. He goes back to the Senate and then he's appointed secretary of state. So he takes a really interesting path to become secretary. And he's also, uh, I don't think he really gets the credit he deserves for successfully negotiating the release of the American hostages in Iran. Yes, and because they were released the day after Jimmy Carter left office. Carter was defeated for re-election and wasn't the, the Iranians waited till the next day after mm -hmm. uh, Carter was out. But of course, the negotiations had been going on for months before that. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, for poor Ed Muskie uh, coming in, in in May of uh, 1980, his uh, term as, as Secretary of State ended with Jimmy Carter's presidency. Right, so a very short term, but he, he did a lot as mm -hmm. secretary. So we have a couple minutes left before uh, we take Q&A. So let's move on to the next slide because I really wanna talk about the modern era. Um, our current secretary, Antony Blinken, has never held elected political office. Our previous secretary of state, Mike Pompeo, came from the House of Representatives and had been CIA director. But it seemed for a while that you really had senators who were becoming a uh, running for the presidency and then becoming secretary of state. This, this goes back to that again, idea of the people having stature. Uh, I was just reading Barack Obama's memoirs and he talks about choosing Hillary Clinton for secretary of state. She had been his chief rival for the nomination. They'd fought ferociously mm -hmm. and right up to the convention. And so he was not immediately, uh, I, uh, you know, amenable to this idea of having her in his cabinet, but he realized that he had, and he describes it in his book as star power. She came in as someone who was well known, not only in the nation, but around the world. Uh, and uh, that uh, she was going to add stature to his new uh, administration. He was a, a relatively new person in Washington. He'd only served four years in the United States Senate. She was not only a Senator, but she had been first lady for eight years. Uh, and so she brought uh, quite a bit to his administration. Uh, and uh, that you see that uh, same playing out the same ideas as William Jennings Bryan, uh, that uh, and other uh, uh, political figures who have uh, taken the position, that uh, they've got uh, individual reputations that uh, that they bring with them into this uh, into the position. John Kerry ran for president in 2004, came very close to winning that election, had been chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, and he then became the second uh, Secretary of State under Barack Obama. So, uh, so there's they're carrying it forward. But you know that it also goes back to the earlier days when we talk about Henry Clay. Uh, there's a connection to some degree to Hillary Clinton because Clay had to cast votes on every controversial issue, and those votes were held against him mm -hmm. when he ran for president. Hillary Clinton had to cast votes as a U.S. Senator, and one of the votes she cast was for going to war in Iraq in, in 2003. And there were many people who absolutely supported her on every other issue, yes. but they couldn't bring themselves to support her uh, because she had voted for war in Iraq. And one of the things that Barack Obama had was a stance against the war. And so it, it goes back to that day that senators make themselves controversial. The longer you serve in the Senate, the harder it is to become elected president. It, the three senators who went directly from the Senate to the White House were not leading senators. They were backbench senators, Warren G. Harding, John F. Kennedy, and Barack Obama. Not, uh, hadn't served for a very long time. They were in leadership positions. Right. Uh, they, they, they were more amenable to creating a large national supports, broadening their base, uh, whereas a lot of other senators have narrowed their bases by the, by the votes they cast. That's such an interesting observation. On the one hand, 
you want somebody who has those years and years and years of expertise instead of the newbies and, and, and the ones who don't really have all that much experience, but they're the ones that made it to the presidency because you're right. They didn't carry all that baggage with them, but then they come into uh, that very important position of secretary of state where then they can bring all those years and years and years of expertise. So interesting. Well, I see we have some questions rolling in, Don. Did you want to say any last words about um, Clinton or Kerry? Well, no, but just one thing is that uh, uh, many of the senators, as I mentioned, 25 senators have served as Secretary of State. Many of them served on the Foreign Relations Committee and had experience in that. And it's quite striking that the newest Secretary of State was the staff director of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and that was for Chairman Joe Biden. And so there's a connection between that committee and the, uh, and the State Department, not only do, because the thing that the Senate does is they get to confirm all of the secretaries of state and all the diplomats that go on. They also uh, certainly have to pass on any funding that the department gets and any treaty that the department negotiates, only the Senate will be involved in, uh, in uh, supporting it for its ratification. So there is a very close connection and senators in general have uh, paid a lot more attention to foreign policy. I think they're expected to. Uh, a lot of House members don't feel that they, they get a lot of uh, support in their district on foreign policy issues. They're much more interested in bread and butter issues in their districts. But senators are, especially if they have national aspirations, and quite frankly, almost every senator does have a national aspiration, uh, they, they do pay much more attention to foreign policy or to at least to military policy. Well, based upon the trend, it seems like that's the best way to go <laughs> from the Senate to, to the White House. Well, thank you, Don, for that. I, I'm gonna start um, with our first question here. This comes from Connor. These days, secretaries of state adhere closely to the agenda and perspectives of the president who appointed them. Are there examples of secretaries who have publicly clashed with their presidents? Well, there's certainly, I, I make a distinction between publicly and privately, but certainly there have been secretaries of state who have given their presidents great difficulties. Uh, uh, William James Bryan being a very good example of that. I'm thinking about uh, when Lincoln took over, his Secretary of State, uh, William Seward, who had been his rival for the nomination and was in fact a much more better known national politician, uh, came up with a very strange idea that we should start a war with England to bring the, the, uh, the South back in, that suddenly we would now be, if we were attacked from outside that the nation would reunite yeah, that was a and, horrible uh, idea. <laughs> Lincoln had to suggest to him that he only wanted to fight one war at a time. Uh, and so uh, eventually Seward became Lincoln's strongest defender and, uh, and real asset in their, that administration. But presidents have had to rein in their secretaries of state from time to time when they've gone on uh, uh, independently. Uh, in recent years, uh, secretaries of state have uh, have been a bit more discreet uh, than some of the early ones, but there certainly were some that, that left uh, very unhappily, including uh, Wilson's second uh, Secretary of State, uh, Robert Lansing. Uh, they fell out over the, uh, uh, the, the problem was that Wilson became sick, uh, he had a stroke, and Lansing convened the cabinet in his absence so that the government would continue. And when Wilson was well enough, the first thing he did was to fire Lansing for insubordination. So, uh, that's one of the, the difficulties uh, that secretaries of state may face sometimes. Well, it's a very powerful senior position, which I think when new presidents come in, they really fight to have their secretary of state with them on day one, if they can. Right, and of course in the line of presidential succession, the secretary of state is number one in the cabinet. And for a long time, the secretary of state was right after the vice president. They had taken the members of Congress out of the equation. It was Harry Truman who felt that an elected official should be next and hmm. put the, the Speaker of the House and the President pro temporary of the Senate back in, uh, yeah. in the line of succession. But the, pre the uh, Secretary of State is next in line. And, and uh, of course, uh, uh, Al Haig, as Secretary of State, created some controversy on the day that Ronald Reagan uh, was shot by asserting that he was in charge. That's right. uh, which, unfortunately, the, uh, Reagan did have a vice president who <laughs> felt that he was in charge in the absence, but uh, that did do uh, Al Haig a lot of good in terms of uh, his relations with Ronald Reagan or George Bush. 
Yeah, because if the worst had happened, he still wouldn't have been in charge. So no. that rather that was rather odd. Well, um, Bush was out of town that day, so <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Well, I, I'm here for the for the moment. Here I am. Um, here's another question that came in from Liz. Looking back at these individuals, what do you see as the key skills or qualities that cabinet secretaries or senators need to have in order to become president? Uh -huh. Well, uh, again, it's a matter of, of the developing respect and developing uh, stature, uh, being looked upon as somebody that you trust. Uh, and that uh, I think uh, that in the early days, especially when it was not a political position in the modern sense, when other politicians chose them, one reason they went to secretaries of state was because they stood tall uh, and people thought these were the people who really deserved to be uh, uh, president. These days, of course, uh, politics is sort of outside of Washington. A lot of people running for office are running against the government. Uh, you know, Jimmy Carter ran as an outsider. Even Richard Nixon, when he ran in 68, uh, ran as sort of who was rested and relaxed. He'd been out of office for eight <laughs> years. And the sense was that if you're not part of Washington, you're going to be a breath of fresh air. We turn to generals like Eisenhower. We turn to businessmen, somebody who, who don't have uh, that all the credentials, all the heavy weight of having served in Washington, which is a little ironic. I mean, you'd think that for a job that requires so much, you'd want people who are well trained for it. Uh, but uh, certainly the voters have been looking for somebody new and somebody different and maybe a glimmer of hope uh, in the, when they cast their ballot. Yeah, right. I, I mean, I, I think, you know, just thinking about Kennedy and that idea of the fresh face and he's very young and very inexperienced. He's a right. war hero, but uh, it, it's it's really very interesting. So people always think like, well, now, you know, they just want the the, you know, most, um, you know, animated person so that they could watch them. But this is nothing new. Right. Now, John Kennedy, interestingly, when he became president, did not turn to the leader of his party, the person who had run twice before him, Adlai Stevenson. Everybody thought oh, Stevenson right. was the natural to be Secretary of State. Mm -hmm. And a lot of other people thought that uh, J. William Fulbright, the very prestigious chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, was a, a likely candidate. And Kennedy didn't choose either of them. He chose uh, uh, Dean Rusk, who was at that point the head of the Rockefeller Foundation. N not as well known, somebody who served in the State Department, but certainly without the stature that uh, either uh, uh, Stevenson or Fulbright had. And that was, I think, because John Kennedy wanted people to know that he intended to be his own Secretary of State. And he wasn't about to, to uh, battle with somebody of a, of a different mind. That's really interesting. So you know that you don't have the chops yet. So you don't want somebody that has the chops telling you what to do. Did Adlai Stevenson feel snubbed? Did he ever comment about that? I think Adlai Stevenson did feel uh, that he, he should have been Secretary of State, but uh, Kennedy appointed him to be ambassador to the United Nations. Right. And Stevenson took the job and performed magnificently mm -hmm. as, as uh, ambassador. Uh, and so he Stevenson had a sense of duty to the nation, but I think uh, it hurt him quite a bit because he did oppose Kennedy's nomination at the convention. And yeah, that that's is one of the problem. prices that you'll have to pay. I, yeah, that's, yep, yeah, I could, yeah, that makes total sense. Interesting. I mean, yeah, him being ambassador during this whole decolonization movements, but that's a whole other story. We have a, another question. Uh, this comes from Dave. Which historical secretary may have been most suited to address the issues we face today, which mm. have a global nature? Uh, you know, I think that many of the early secretaries of state thought they had it tough, but they would probably be astonished at the issues that a modern secretary of state has to face. Uh, I mean, they were brilliant men who, are, who served as secretary of state, someone like Thomas Jefferson and, and uh, James Madison and others. But um, the issues that 18th and 19th century set, and even early 20th century secretaries have faced have been... Um, you know, are, are things that I don't think that they could imagine. In terms of modern secretaries of state, one of the people I've always admired enormously was George Marshall, who had been chief of staff of the army during World War II, was one of the architects of our victory, was the author of the Marshall Plan, mm -hmm. uh, was uh, 
a, a man who came back reluctantly to serve as Secretary of State and also to serve as Secretary of Defense. Uh, and uh, uh, I think as a man who was able to uh, uh, quietly uh, tackle whatever the, t the problems were, and certainly the early Cold War problems were quite enormous. But even Marshall would probably be shocked at some of the issues that a modern Secretary of State has to face. Well, Marshall really holds a, a warm place in, in our hearts because we at the 21st Street entrance where the museum is, that's the original entry to the State Department, which used to be the War Department building. So uh, Secretary Marshall was the first Secretary of State to occupy the building as secretary when it was turned over to the State Department. Yes, the State Department used to work out of the beautiful building right next to the White House, now called the Eisenhower Building, but used to be the old uh, State War and, and Navy building. Uh, just a gorgeous uh, building in space. And even today, if you go through it, uh, it's been restored uh, uh, in, to its magnificence. But they, they were moving out, uh, the War Department was moving out at first. And so they built this building, but by the time World War II started, it was, wasn't uh, even big enough. So they had to build a bigger building, the Pentagon. There are some murals in the Department of State that are not very pacifistic. They're quite military. They're usually hidden behind curtains because they don't reflect the image of the, Sec the State Department these days, but they do re remind us that that building was originally intended to be for the War Department. Very good point, Don. And when our visitors come into our museum, they can actually see that one mural at the 21st Street entrance. It's called Defense of Human Freedoms. And it outlines FDR's four freedoms, but it shows the military and bombs and screaming eagles. And, you know, so it's always a fun story for us to tell, you know, it's like, well, do you think that's kind of diplomatic? And they're like, oh, wow, that, you know, that's so interesting. So that history is preserved. So it looks like we have time for, for one more question. And this comes from Chris. The most recent cabinet secretary to become president was Herbert Hoover. Do you anticipate another former cabinet secretary running for president in the not too distant future? Well, it says something that you have people like uh, James Buchanan and Herbert Hoover who uh, come out of the cabinet and become president. They have wonderful resumes. Uh, Herbert Hoover on paper was, was eminently suited to be president in the United States. The politicians didn't like him, but the people liked him. And he really was elected because of enormous popular support for him. He'd been uh, involved in um, uh, aid to, the, to Europe during World War I. Uh, and as Secretary of, of uh, Commerce, he'd been, uh, the joke was he was undersecretary of everything else because he had a hand in every issue that was going on. And particularly when the Mississippi River flooded in 1927, he took over the relief efforts involved in that. So he was looked at um, as the family doctor who would step in for any emergency. And he became uh, president. He spent a lot of time on foreign policy. His uh, Secretary of State was Henry Simpson and uh, Simpson and uh, Hoover didn't get along all that well. Uh, Simpson uh, d doesn't describe him all that flatteringly in his diary, uh, but uh, they, they were of like mind on, on many issues. But uh, Hoover's administration was sort of one disaster after another. The Great Depression hit, his responses to it did not give the nation hope and having been elected by a landslide in 1928, he was defeated by a landslide in 1932. And in fact, uh, the Democratic Party spent the next 30 or 40 years running against Herbert Hoover because uh, the voters didn't forgive him for, uh, for his disastrous presidency. So it doesn't say a lot, but, uh, but hope springs eternal. And there may be some cabinet secretaries uh, then uh, coming up that uh, will perhaps be, see themselves as presidential candidates in the future, and maybe they'll do a better job than Buchanan and Hoover. Well, we'll have to wait and see. It, it'll be, it's going to be an interesting, you know, um, next 25 years. <laughs> That's all I could say. So this has been a fabulous discussion. And thank you for bringing all these rich stories to our audience. We greatly appreciate you being here. And uh, we welcome all of our uh, viewers to follow us on social media. If you go to the next slide, Victoria, I think uh, we have a final slide. That's all of our social media handles and our website. And uh, you know, if you know anyone that would be interested in this program, they do live on our YouTube channel. And also you can watch it anytime on our webpage. And once again, Don, you know, from deep in my heart, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Well, thank you. It's been my pleasure. Okay, we'll talk soon.
Bye.